And it looking, I see there are about 42 people who have joined today. Please note that the session will be recorded. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Global Neurology Forum Track 1 Clinical Pathological Case Conference Session. Um, this session is called The Crumbling Tower of Babel, and you'll soon know why. My name is Camilla Latta, and I'm the Program Director of Alumni Relations and Special Initiatives at GBHI at UCSF in San Francisco. We're also very fortunate to have a GBHI sister site in Dublin, Ireland. As we begin, we also pause briefly to recognize the land we are on here locally of the Ramatush Ohlone people. Thank you. This is a public session that is being recorded. We're happy to have you all from national and international locations. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Global Atlantic Fellows for Equity and Brain Health from GBHI who are joining today. Welcome. Please share ideas and comments freely in the chat and mute yourselves. I'd like to also acknowledge and thank my colleague, Winnie Sue, who is managing technology for this session. This series is organized through a collaboration between GBHI and the UCSF Global Teleneurology Service. As mentioned, the forum today is track one, a CPC. There is also track two, core challenges in global neurology. The presentations are provided for educational purposes only. And now I'm very pleased to pass the baton to Dr. Salvatore Spina, who is one of the curators of this series. Salvo is an associate professor of neurology at UCSF and a professor with GBHI. He has curated today's forum and will be providing comments at various points. Welcome, Salvo. Good morning, everyone, and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon for those uh, uh, joining us from uh, a little part away. So uh, we welcome you to this uh, clinical pathological conference today that will be presented by uh, Luis Martinez. And we are very uh, lucky to also have with us uh, Boom Lee T and Jessica De Leon, the assistant professors at the uh, Memory and Aging Center. So can I have the next slide? So. Uh, so this is uh, just a, a very um, a brief uh, uh, scheme of how today's um, presentation is going to go. So Luis Martinez, Dr. Martinez, will present the case first. We then uh, uh, unravel the neuropathology, and then we will have a, a discussion to go through uh, the learning points from this case, uh, followed by, uh, we, hopefully, uh, we, we hope, a very rich uh, a session of questions and answers with the uh, participation from the audience, and then closing remarks from Luis. Next slide. So before we for, we start, I just want to clarify so that the case that in, in the CPC it's um, is a case that is inspired from uh, from a real uh, um, a patient, a real person, uh, uh, usually a research participant in our court. It is not necessarily the true story of the specific person, but we only use again like a case for inspiration um, based on some particular uh, aspects of their clinical history or the findings that we will that we will discuss play in the neuropath. The neuropathology is indeed, I mean, the true neuropathology. Um, but again, so uh, no information that will be presented in, um, today needs to be interpreted as absolutely true or unique of a specific person. <laughs> So um, the presenter today is uh, Dr. Luis Martinez. Uh, Luis is originally from Colombia and is an Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health with the Global Brain Health Institute. He graduated from medical school um, in Colombia, the Universidad del Rosario. And then he worked uh, immediately with an organization called CEDESNIT, uh, which is a public foundation that is involved in uh, research and work activity, especially in the low economic resources, disability, and the neurological diseases in the city of uh, uh, Bogota. He also received his master's degree in neurology from Universidad de Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina. And then he has began working on uh, memory and aging uh, at Hospital de la Santa Cruz in uh, San Paul, uh, Barcelona, uh, Spain. He's a neurologist and a researcher working uh, in uh, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and is uh, a uh, exceptional artist, and particularly a visual artist and, uh, um, um, and a painter. Uh, and we will see some of, uh, of his creativity in today's uh, presentation. He's also been instrumental in our 
our collaboration with the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and is an active member of the GBHI Creative uh, Minds uh, Community Outreach Program. So without further ado, I uh, will introduce Luis and he will present us the case. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Salvatore, for this kind introduction. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, maybe good night for all around the world, some of you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today, and I can see some familiar faces, lovely faces in the screen. Thank you so very much for being here today. And let me, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen properly? Yes, looks beautiful. Okay, thank you and welcome to the session of the Global Neurology Forum, the Crumble uh, Tower of Babel, Babel Tower. Okay, before to start with the presentation, I want to invite you to participate in our Zoom pool, answering these two questions that briefly will appear on your Zoom screen with different options of answers. How many languages do you speak? How many languages you, will you be able to, to read and write in? Our dear Camilla will share the results soon. In the meantime, I want to say that we don't have any financial disclosure. And as Dr. Salvo said, all the information of the case uh, presented was partially modified to protect individuals' privacy. So thank you all for participating with your answers. And we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two and one. We're closing the poll and sharing the results. Luis, how does this look? That's great, Camilia. In the first question, we can see that uh, our audience has uh, at least two languages and they are able to read uh, and write at least uh, two languages as well in the majority of our audience. Thank you all for participating uh, in, this, in this Zoom pool. So the Babel Tower is a biblical story given in Genesis to be an attempt to explain the existence of diverse human languages. According to the Bible, at this time, the whole world spoke one language. Everyone used to, say, used to use the same words and language. The Babylonians wanted to build a tower to challenge good power on air. God, as a punishment, interrupted war, confusing so much the language of the workers that they could no longer understand each other. And from this punishment, God created different languages for the human being. After this short introduction about this, the, our session title, I'm going to tell you a story of a 67-year-old woman, right-handed retired professional translator. In her spare time, she attends a senior center language group where she teaches foreign languages and attends cultural meetings in Mandarin, Arabic, and Spanish. She was born in Berlin, Germany. Her parents were American citizens. Her father born and raised in the United States and her mother, German, later naturalized American. Her father was a diplomat for that reason she traveled a lot and moved to different countries in her childhood and adolescence. She lived and attended school in multiple cities like Berlin, Hanoi, Shanghai, but she always considered English to be her first language, which was spoken at home. During her life, she was able to be fluent in German, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Spanish, and Arabic. So we can see that she was able to speak, read, and write in six different languages due to the, her childhood, her education, and her career. English, German, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Spanish, and Arabic. In this table, uh, we can see that our patient was proficient in English and German since childhood. She speaks German without formal education until six years at home. Nevertheless, at home, they prefer to speak English all the time. Her father was a diplomat, so she lived and attended a school in multiple cities like Hanoi and Shanghai where she learned Vietnamese and Mandarin with good spoken and writing abilities. Later then in her college, she received an education in Spanish as well. And she took lessons on college of Vietnamese and Mandarin. Although she already knew this language living in a, and studying uh, at, uh, at a school in Vietnam and China as well. At the age of 30, 35, she also studied Arabic, acquiring more spoken ability than writing ability in this language as well. 
She reads from an early age and has always been a voracious reader. She has an instinctive propensity to learn new languages. For that reason, she studied to become a professional translator in Mandarin and Vietnamese first, and later also Arabic. She worked in the United Nations for 30 years as a professional translator, and later as a language and cultural advisor for a technology company until her retirement at the age of 63. In her spare time, she really enjoyed riding horses. Well, she, start, uh, she presents with a six year history of slowly progressive speech difficulties with a steeper decline in the prior four years and three years of right side motor problems. She first noticed these speech difficulties during a family trip to Buenos Aires, Argentina at age 61. While previously very fluent in Spanish, she now finds difficult to make herself understood when pronouncing basic, basic Spanish words. She initially attributes the difficulties to the phonetic differences between European and Latin American Spanish, but feels her uh, struggle weird uh, and nothing like she was experiencing before. Starting around age 64, she begins having problems teaching at the senior center due to inappropriate phonetic transitions between English, Mandarin, and Vietnamese. She said, my students tell me that my Vietnamese has started to sound a lot more like Mandarin and that I speak in English with a Mandarin accent. At the age of 65, at the cultural meetings, she developed problems following conversation in Hispanics and Arabic. She accidentally switched between languages when replying some questions. At this point, she was worried and seeks for medical attention. She also realized that she can no longer read Arabic in her mind. And to uh, her most surprise, she also struggles reading her old German books. Moreover, she begins complaining of war, fine difficulties also in English. Around age 66, she developed more deficit in English speaking too. She started occasionally stumble on certain words such as minimum and broccoli. And she also had difficulties getting syllables in the right order. She will sometimes transpose sounds, particularly R and L. And she makes errors, for instance, solder for father, or payable for table, and breakfast for dinner. She received an evaluation of neurologists with a screening, uh, uh, with a screening neuropsychological testing and an MRI, both interpreted as a normal. Nevertheless, she referred. It is not my imagination that my ability to say words has deteriorated. On a daily casual basis, it is not noticeable, but people who know me can hear the difference. At this point, she requests to work with a speech pathologist. Despite the speech therapy, her language ability still declined. Her speech became progressively effortful, and she could no longer ever think the words that she was trying to say. It. She referred, I couldn't visualize the phonics and the tones, and I couldn't hear the sound. During the most recent three years, she also started start to notice difficulty using her right hand, which initially dismissed all for uh, her more severe concerns of the degradation of her language skills. It began with a struggle with figuring out how to clip on her dog leash, then with problems clipping her nails, and later, then using scissors as well, and with the control of her right leg, leg when riding horses. Later, she referred her right arm to start having a mind of his own. For instance, when occasionally pour out of glass that she's holding, or reach for a hot pan without an oven meat on. There was an episode where uh, this resulted in, uh, in her shutting her right thumb in the car door. Moreover, she developed shallowing difficulties as well and difficulties controlling facial movements. For instance, her son gave her uh, a piece of bar to smell and rather than sniffing it, she tried to kiss it. Her son noticed these difficulties controlling facial movements. He referred, when someone asks at her, at her to smile, she will stick her tongue out. And if someone asks her to stick her tongue out, she is unable to do it. She develops more frequent difficulties understanding some words, for example, when her son says the word mushroom. 
Louise, could, could I make a comment on that slide? Maybe go back one. Of course, Dr. Bruce. Yeah, so uh, the, this is what uh, I think is a very localizing symptom. It, uh, uh, this inability to uh, use uh, uh, your mouth uh, to command. Um, often, though, uh, you know, these people can do it spontaneously. So it's, a, it's an apraxia. It's an oral buccal apraxia. And, and I think it's very strongly localized, much, much more localizing than limb apraxia to the opercular region, often bilateral. So, uh, you know, I think th this is a very important finding, which you don't see that often. But I, you know, I, I think this one is really helpful in localizing this unbelievably complicated case. Sorry, yeah. Thank you so very much, Dr. Miller, for the comment. Yeah, that's 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 great. Um, we will see in the with the physical examination, the neurological examination, and now we have the uh, past medical history. So related to the horse riding, she had in total five concussions three of them with loss of consciousness. Her most severe concussion was a teenager, uh, as, a, as a teenager, and was the first one. Six years ago was her most recent concussion around the time of the symptoms onset. She had a chronic daily headaches since more recent traumatic brain injury. She had remote history of depression as well and suspected attention deficit hyperactivity disorder during the her middle school. Her current medication is nortriptyline 30 milligrams every night at the time. Talking about her social story, she lives alone, she married in her 20s, and has two healthy children. Ten, ten years ago, her husband passed away. She enjoys, enjoys hiking, watching movies, spending time with friends, and she also continues riding horses. She's a non-drinker, non-smoker, and no substance abuser. Her mother was from Berlin, Germany. She was cognitively sharp until the time of her death, and she died at age 96. Her father was an American of German descendant. He had mild memory problems starting at the age of 90 and lived until the age of 91. Now let me tell you her physical and neurological examination at the age of 67. L Louise? Do, do you think we might ask, before you give the exam, we might ask somebody from the symptoms, which, you know, uh, where in the brain this problem is and, uh, uh, and, and what they think the underlying pathology might be? Um, sure. Uh, someone in the audience want to participate in ideas before the neurological examination? Uh, well, I see Rafi. I always want to hear Rafi's opinion. So <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> I figured. Uh, so uh, what I can conclude, like I was trying to, also, she have a lot of symptoms, but like what what is prominent is like uh, some um, some some primary progressive aphasia type of that. I think it's a more logopenic because of this phonemic errors and single word finding difficulties and things like that. But what we have additionally is the movement disorder that is like uh, uh, unilateral. And is also we have this oral apraxia, so maybe it's CBD. I don't know. Maybe it's CBD with some pathology that is making the clinical together. So if I if you will ask me already about pathology, I think it's AD. I don't know if, <laughs> if I am correct or not. Okay, so uh, would you call this a non-fluent language disorder? Oh, it's complicated. Gosh, there's lots of languages. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we could get Jessica or Boon Lee to comment on the symptoms, uh, you know, what, what, what they think uh, this uh, tells us about localization at this point. Yeah, we, we have Jessica and Boon Lee like in the discussion panel, so maybe we can, uh, <laughs> we can ask uh, also other people in the audience to first tell us what they think. Bruce, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you all right? <laughs> Uh, anybody else wants to add on uh, Rafi's comment? And also, Rafi mentioned if nobody else wants to add. I mean, you say that a, there's an AD flavor. Is that what you said? That was yeah. your first guess. Why is that? What What's uh, telling you that? 
No, just, you know, because I thought that is locopenic and CBD. So I okay. think that both of them can be AD, like this is the only thing, right? Okay, so like... In like a pathology that can combine uh, both diseases, yeah. so this is what I thought about. <laughs> okay, very good. Anybody else have a different opinion? Oh, we, we need one, a different opinion. Uh, uh, how about how about uh, Hana Cho? Hana, do, do you think this this is posterior, or could it possibly be in the frontotemporal lobar degeneration pathology area? I think, uh, as I understand, uh, she is started by language problem. So even though she is a multi-language person, but she started definitely language problem and after uh, followed by memory problem and some Parkinsonism or some movement problems. So, and also I think I can localize uh, 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 in the posterior part more than frontal and the left part more than right, uh, more than right part. Yeah. Can I just like obsess on the oral buccal apraxia? Let, let me say this. I have never seen an Alzheimer patient with prominent oral buccal apraxia uh, as a relatively early presentation. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you, everyone. So at least let's continue. Okay. So let's continue with the neurological examination um, at the age of 67. She was fully cooperative and without acute distress. She was alert, attentive, and socially appropriate. Her speech was effortful, not fluent, and helping with some distortions, syntactical errors, and morphological errors as well. And she also demonstrated insight into her speech errors. She has just no and he and she antinomic substitution. And she retains semantic knowledge of the numbers, but she just fingers to communicate the numbers. She has more difficulty repeating multisyllabic words like artillery, catastrophe, and progressive. She has severe orofacial and ideomotor apraxia at the upper extremities, words on the right. For instance, when asked to demonstrate how, how she will hammer a nail with her left hand, she made hand motions as though, though she were seeing seats. And when asked to demonstrate how she will, she will sew a piece of wood with her right hand, she made clicking noises and no sensical hand motions. She also had impaired graphisticia in both hands and mild difficulties mimicking meaningless hand gestures on the left. The stereognosis was normal bilaterally, and there is no extinction or neglect to visual or tactile stimuli. Her dragon a horse is still recognizable. Regarding cranial nerves in the neurological examination, the fundoscopy was within normal limits, visual fields normal, extraocular movements without abnormalities, the facial sensation and strain was normal. Her lateral thumb movements were slow and laborious without fasciculations. In the motor examination, there was most rigidity in the right upper extremity without cogwheeling without tremors or dystonia, no alien limb phenomena, no asterixis or other abnormal movements were observed, and all the sensory examination was within normal limits. At the coordination examination, the fists opening, closing, and finger tapping were slow and clumsy bilaterally, more so on the right and with mirroring in the right lower extremity. The foot taping is clumsy on the right and normal on the left, and the fingers, no fingers, was normal bilaterally without dysmetria. The gait examination was within normal limits. Now we will continue with the neuropsychological assessment of our patient. But do we have any guess of the minimental scores and one want to predict the result according to the neurological examination and information of the case? Some guessed? Okay. Go ahead, Rafi. <laughs> I think I missed a lot of things in the neurological exam, so I would like to hear it again also. 
you want to summarize, Luis, like the most uh, yeah. important findings on exams? So, sure. Um, I had the most important in cranial nerves, we they don't have uh, important findings. I think the most important is the motor examination. There was uh, more rigidity in the right upper extremity without co-willing. Uh, no alien limb phenomena because in the in the at the beginning she referred like uh, the 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 right arm was having a mind of his own, but in the physical examination there was no alien limb phenomena, no asterixis or abnormal movements, and the coordination was uh, a little bit uh, slow and clumsy uh, with the fist opening and closing and finger typing as well. Uh, the foot typing was clumsy as well on the right. And the gait examination was completely normal within normal limits. So I can say something just to understand better. So you say it's there is an increased tone, like, but it's not rigid. So a spastic like tone. What well, what is the increased tone of this one like? But if it's rigid, so maybe it's cog. There is no cog with no. So it's not rigid. What you what? Uh, we interpret it without cog willing less uh, uh, the. As a rigidity, but no hypertone. The tone was normal. So it's not spastic, but yeah. there was also no cogwheeling reported. But it's not spastic. It doesn't get worse with uh, acceleration. So yeah. yeah. So fair to say, Salvo, it's basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We thought extra pyramidal. Okay, so let's check the neuropsychological evaluation. Using the minimental uh, state exam, our patient scored 12 out of 13 with our previous minimental 20 out of 30 one year ago. She lost points on time and place orientation in learning, work backyards, delayed recall, naming, repetition, follow okay. order, writing a sentence, and Pentagon copy. In the memory assessment of our patient, uh, she was unable to perform the California verbal learning test. Regarding to the language assessment on Boston naming test, she named one out of 15 items spontaneously. She was unable to perform the wide range achievement test reading scale. She scored five out of five on sentence comprehension, and she was unable to perform verbal agility and reputation as well. Regarding the, the visual spatial skills, she was not able to accurately copy intersecting pentagons, and she correctly copied 11 out of 17 elements on the Benson figure. On visual object and spatial perception, she answered seven out of 10 correctly, and she performed zero out of five writing calculations. Her face perception was intact, scoring 12 out of 12, and she was able to correctly identify faces with a particular emotion uh, 11 out of 16 times. Regarding to the working memory and executive function, our patient was unable to spell word backyard. Her digit span forward was three and back, backyard was two. On the test of cognitive flexibility, fluency, and self shifting, she was not able to perform the test. Uh, uh, she wasn't able to perform a strip color naming, inhibition, lexical fluency, and semantic fluency. On the test of abstraction, she was not able to perform, and regarding the psychiatric and behavioral symptoms, she was 14 out of 13 on the juratic depression scale, being indicative of severe depression. So let's uh, see with all the information that we have given, the neurological, the neurological examination and neuropsychological assessment, what would be the clinical syndrome of our patient? Anyone to... Please? Could, could we go back to the neuropsych? I just want to make a comment. Um, so uh, so uh, I think when you're faced with neuropsych where most things are abnormal, and usually that starts to happen when the mini is less than 15, I think your neuropsych becomes much less valuable, uh, you know, the lower in terms of localizing. So the things that I look at, you know, are... Um, what are things that they did well? Uh, in other words, what brain areas are, are maybe possibly spared? And here we're talking about relatively well. Um, Benson copy isn't terrible. That's parietal, right? Uh, object knowledge isn't terrible. Anterior temporal, maybe. Uh, face perception isn't bad. Um, 
Well, uh, that's uh, an affect naming isn't terrible. That, that's ventral. So I, I would say maybe in comprehension, which is, you know, uh, left posterior are, are relatively spared. So I, I think you're getting a, a picture that the frontal systems are devastated, but, uh, you know, there is some sparing of ventral stream, temporal, uh, and, and, and maybe some parietal sparing as well. Thank you so very much, Dr. Bruce. Yeah. Thank right you, uh, Bruce. Uh, anyone, if I may ask, wants to comment on the BNT of one, one out of 15. So that was definitely like, in the, I think, one of the worst performance. Yeah. I mean, with, with the, you know, with the comment that, of course, that Bruce made, I mean, of course, so, I mean, we're starting from a very low mini, but uh, does anyone who wants to comment on that? What's behind that very poor performance and naming? Is it difficulty with uh, uh, getting the name out? Yeah, I think we should have a description for the Boston for being able to say something. Because what is what was the problem there? You know, like maybe like I, I, for me, I didn't understand. You know, it's terrible like results. But it's still not saying it's depending if she recognized like I don't know with some uh, some indications or something or some cooling. So yeah, I really cannot comment on that. Let's say uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. information about but, what's happened there. Luis, do we have the that information or no? No, unfortunately. We don't we... have the information. So what are the options, basically, Rafi, just so for everyone to, to understand your comment. So what's the difference between if somebody like answer with cues or with the descriptors or providing think, an information? Well, first of all, it's important to know if there is a semantic problem. But I think that, I don't know, like seems that she don't have a semantic problem. I, I don't know. Also, if she have like this one for, for uh, uh, one from 15 like items, but you know, if if like she recognized the item in some way, or she still know what is the item, so the semantic is reserved. So I think the description of the test will be more helpful to understand what is happening. So this one, or she don't have any knowledge for the test. So I don't know. Like in general, they so it's to differentiate the naming from like a semantic problem. Yeah. yeah. There are, there are also some questions from Marilu. Yeah, Marilu, you you want to comment? Uh, yes. Hi. Um, my internet is unstable, so sorry, I can't show myself, but I, to what it was said, you know, the, uh, her object knowledge is 11 out of 16. So her semantics mm -hmm. are probably good. It's, I, I was just wondering if she's mute, if she can articulate any words, is this motor speech or, um, uh, because verbal agility is, says unable to perform. So it seems to me that she might not be able to articulate speech. I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely a difficulty with uh, uh, articulation of speech that is predominant. Yeah, so and definitely um, affecting the many of her performance overall. Yeah, she's not completely mute, but uh, uh, yeah, but it's um, there is one of the, it's a major problem. Definitely, is an enunciation of speech. Yeah, so in the BNT, if the words are not um, distinguishable, if they're not intelligible, then you lose you lose points. So it, it, it might partially at least be that. And again, mm -hmm. we're I, I think we're at a stage where lots of pathologies merge uh, in terms of an, the anatomy of a degenerative disease. So the elephant in the room here if you're gonna really get this right is, what were the first symptoms? And, and what is the motor elephant in the room here? I mean, they're, they're, you know, I, I think we're dealing with, you know, a very uh, devastated brain, but when people talk about, you know, the central features of this, don't forget the problems with the hand, very unusual problems uh, and uh, the, the motor difficulty as well. Not bilateral, but unilateral. Great, thank you. So, anyone wants to guess the clinical uh, <clears throat> syndrome or want to uh, clarify this or <clears throat> select one predominant to another one? So, I mean, there's probably some competing one syndromes, right? But let's say that we need to pick one, like in relationship to the timeline, also how the symptoms developed. 
what's the most likely clinical syndrome? Anybody wants um, to? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so this might call Gesh one. Um, oh, I, 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 had, I had a question. Um, I had a question going back to the. Um, I thought somebody had said that there was basal ganglia involvement, and um, if they did say that, regardless of whether they said that, I'm just thinking of it in terms of the, the movement, the motor function, and it sounded like there was an alien limb phenomenon, um, which, and it sounded like there might have been a grasping phenomenon. I think her hand was was doing them something she didn't want to. So, uh, you know, I, I think of that as being very cortically based, um, possibly corpus callosal. Um, I, there wasn't intermanual grasping. And then I didn't, um, I, I can't recall if on the exam there was Parkinsonism. I, I didn't think there was, there was some problems moving the right. So um, to me, it, it, it's a left kind of cortical motor syndrome. And I haven't gotten a flavor of basal ganglia yet. So I just, I didn't mm -hmm. know if people yeah, thought Yeah, I think the Parkinsonism was, it's mostly in that uh, rigidity that is extrapyramidal, like in, in right-sided. So where there is like increased oh, there tone. Was. okay. Yeah, and okay. some- But no, but no cogwheeling. But, but no cogwheeling appreciated, yeah. So that we don't know whether it may, perhaps, you know, the tone was so in, increased that it was even difficult to- uh, to test it, yeah. So, so I'm I'm hearing you leaning toward the cortico-basal syndrome type of uh, diagnosis, Michael. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Finally, very finally. Yeah. finally. <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. And <laughs> can I make a comment of? I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but there are not many faces up there I can call on. So those are, you know, I I think in the future we we need uh, the faces there to to contribute to the CPCs. Uh, Thank you, Rafi, Hana, Maison. So the, there are three kinds of, uh, and I want Maison to dis describe what she thinks this is. Ah, she did. You go, Maison. I, maybe at the end we can talk about the type of different alien limbs. But Maison, you, you tell us what you're thinking. Maison, did you want to un unmute? Uh... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, considering the first um, clinical presentation with language problems or language impairment, it can be, it seems like um, a non-fluent um, PPA or with the, a oral vocal uh, praxia. And um, considering the whole clinical uh, symptoms like uh, alien hand plus minus Parkinsonism and um, a, it can be uh, uh, FTLD spectrum disease, which can be also PPA with CBD um, or CBS pathology. With, so it can be more complicated than a, only one pathology or... Beautiful. And, and yeah. and in this case, we also have a higher cortical um, a functions impairment like uh, graphesthesia and uh, dyscalculia, and so it's a lot is going on uh, on there. I agree that's more left than right, uh, but uh, yeah, this is mm -hmm. my thank you. Yeah, so so the timeline of the symptoms is important, right? So we actually have. Uh, six years of language symptoms, right? And only three years of uh, motoric symptoms. So for those, you know, for the element, you know, choosing the uh, the most appropriate, at least the earliest clinical syndromic presentation. So probably the, the language symptoms, right? That actually predominant, at least like in terms of uh, you know, tempistic, really, like when in the, in, the, in the natural history they happen. So they came earlier. Uh, so the motor symptoms are very uh, significant, but they came later in the disease course. I wanted to okay. just do a quick time check. We have about yep. eight minutes left for this particular section with the case, including Perfect. the path. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Camelia. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you, Camelia. So let's continue. Now it's time to show the neuroimaging of our patient. This is a, the MRI of our patient at age 67. It's an MRI with a contrast on sequence, sequence T1. The left is on the right. And the MRI displays diffuse, although left hemispheric predominant cerebral atrophy, most severe affecting left opercular and left frontal insular regions. 
And there is also anterior temporal atrophy more, more, more mostly on the left. We have some minimal, change, uh, minimal subcortical white matter changes seen on the flare imaging without diffusion weighted anormalities. And now again, now we have the Dr. Salvatore will share with us the neuropathology of our patient. So okay, so so before yeah, we uh, I'll show you the the images and I, I will I can uh, show it from uh, my side when. But before we do that, does uh, is the um, imaging like the MRI informative on which particular pathological entity this patient may have? So uh, we, we discussed before about the few. Does does anyone wants to name like what could be the uh, most likely? Uh, neuropathological diseases behind, you know, the symptoms and this MRI? Maison. Mike was asking about the cerebellum. I don't think the cerebellum is the most significant uh, uh, atrophic region, but uh, I think there's far more that we can describe. Maybe, uh, Luis, can you go back and show the T1 once again? I think you misheard that, Michael. I, I think it was cerebral, not cerebellar. Uh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think cerebellum looks normal. Sorry. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. getting to Bruce's point about the insula, like there is none. <laughs> it's uh, it's bilateral, but it's really uh, there's just so little gray tissue there. I mean, you can see it by the enlarged perisylvian region, but uh, even when you look at the gray matter, it is gone. You're almost down to the white matter. There, there's, there's that little in the middle part of the. Uh, uh, you know, opercular uh, insular area, but it's, it is bilateral uh, atrophy, left much worse than right there. And the hippocampi look relatively spared. Um, the amygdala is a little small on the uh, left, I think a little smaller, but the hippocampi compared to the left, to the cortical atrophy is really mm -hmm. not as bad. And that whole left anterior temporal is really. Um, so, yeah. It's about it. I mean, the, the two big gaping holes are in the in, insula uh, on the left, the left operculum, and the cingulate is pretty bad too. Uh, yeah. I think the, that, you know, that is the, you know, where Bill Seeley calls this, uh, you know, the, the, cent, the, the core of where the disease begins and um, a phenomenally interesting image. So why don't we, so we've had some different guesses. I think Maison, you know, put her flag in the sand and said CBD uh, pathology with tau or TDP43. Which one do you think it is, Maison? And maybe Rafi and Hannah can give their- It might be tauopathy, absolutely, but um, not the AD pathology, I think. Um, it can be uh, CB, CBD pathology or also- TDB A43 pathology. Yeah, take your choice. Um, just... uh, TDP. <laughs> any, any particular reason for TDP versus CBD? Um, I mean, you're referring because to the type very of... various clinical presentation, which is posterior and anterior, posterior atrophy and um, the opercular atrophy. It's a lot of maybe it's mixed pathology also, but um, okay. and regarding the TBI and traumatic brain injury, I take that in, into consideration. Also. That is that is important. Yeah. So and for yeah. TDP, I'm sorry, you're referring to TDP type. Uh, which type? Type A or a, type B? Or um, type uh, a? Maybe mm -hmm. A, yeah. Okay, okay. So, Rafi, and that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. sorry, sorry, Rafi? Yeah, no? Are you going to back down about the Alzheimer's or are you going to stick with the Alzheimer's? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard now, I think, a little bit. Just, <laughs> but now I agree with what my sister said. Right? I don't have anything to add. I, like, I will put or TDP type A or CBD, but like, uh, this one mm -hmm. I can put. Or maybe both of them together. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Any difference between uh, like you know, CBD versus TDP type A as they relate to temporal lobe atrophy? No, so we I see think, quite a bit of temporal lobe atrophy, right? I think maybe the TDP, uh, what? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so, so there's the, 
there's quite a bit of left temporal lobe atrophy. So that is that a discriminant between your CBD versus TDP type A? I agree with both of you. Those two yeah. pathologies tend to choose the same type of uh, regions in the brain, um, but um, the temporal lobe is probably more affected in one versus the other. Uh, these two syndrome, uh, these two pathologies. Morthopathies. I think it's more, more predominant in the hereditary tauopathies, yeah. But you know, the CBD is actually not uh, usually, you know, a disease that will cause a significant degeneration of the temporal lobe, well, while the TDP type A can tends to do that very often. And then, if you want to just go back one more time on the two one, I know that we are a little late, but I want you to so in the second images from the top, so the second from the left on the top row, you can see a hint to a splitting of the septum pellucidum, that it's probably, you know, a marker of a long history of uh, concussion. It could be, okay. It doesn't have to be, sometimes it's developmental, but I think in our case, probably due to the concussions. Okay. So, so I, mm -hmm. Are you able to show with a, a pointer the insular atrophy and the pellucidum? Because I bet a lot of people oh. can, I may not know what, the, uh, or, or Luis. Uh, yeah, so maybe Luis, because I'm not controlling the pointer. Uh, Please yeah, can you show sure. the operculum and uh, and the corp the septum pellucidum. Do you have a uh, pointer? Yeah, I'm trying to find the pointer actually. Uh, or, just, or maybe j just with your uh, with your uh, cursor, I think we can see so your you cursor. See my, my cursor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. So in the see. image uh, above, number two. Yeah, here's the number two. That's three. So the other image on the left, in the image on the left to that, uh, or I can request maybe remote the control. The other left. Yeah. I can request the second, control. second image, the top on the left. Uh, there okay. Is. Can you see here my cursor? No. Not yet. Um, yeah, yeah. It started. Okay. okay, so this is here is uh, maybe I can annotate. So here, here we go. I think you should be able to see here the splitting of the septum pellucidum right there. And then yes. the old opercular area that Brusno was referring to is here. So this is the inferior frontal gyrus here. It's pretty atrophic. The operculum itself, so the entire area is very much enlarged. So it's exposing what's left of the insula that is not that much anymore, right? And then we have this temporal lobe here you know, that is definitely much smaller. So the left, yeah, we're going posterior. So it's even more significant anteriorly, but look at the difference between left and right. So this is quite important. And then there is quite a bit of atrophy also like dorsally, again, single here. Can you see this changes? Yeah, oh, beautiful, beautifully. Okay. Sabo, right. I was wondering whether you could also show pre-SMA and the Aslan fasciculus. That's really like the circuit, I think from pre-motor opercular to pre-SMA and then Aslan is the white matter fasciculus that um... yeah I'm gonna try to clear and see okay yeah so the the uh, pre-SMA is uh, located medially and, and so SMA. and say again sorry see, and... SMA and pre-SMA yeah, so so they will be located more, you know, medially and frontally in the aslant uh, uh, tract. So basically, reach between the you know operculum area and the SMA here. So yeah, it's basically a region where we see like a significant amount also of white matter atrophy yeah. and degeneration. So so yeah, that's uh, thank you, yeah, Marilu. So we're focusing on the cortex, but there's also significant amount of white matter degeneration that. Uh, an atrophy that you can see like a significant difference in the volume of the white matter left and right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we always neglect the white matter, but we should know it. <laughs> I think pre-SMA too, because it's really involved in those symptoms, you know, like yes. Bruce was saying, buccal facial apraxia, but also like this yeah. planning of movement and timing of movement. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now this area here, you know, medially, it's equally devastated, yeah, and the, as the operculum. Yeah, thank you. Very an much. Interesting, if I may, there is an interesting yep. area too that you can see in the 
second image, the bottom second image from the left, there is kind of a big hole in the, in the um, convexity. And that's a region that is being often associated with the larynx and planning right of larynx movements. Mm -hmm. uh, from the, the bottom image, from the- The second, uh, and this one here. Yeah, and there too, yeah. Yeah, so, so here we are approaching yeah, the angular gyrus. Exactly, but, and yeah. is that pre and, you know, it, it, it's all kind of, it's too high, I think, to be the angular gyrus there. But anyway, it's like yeah, bridal yeah. and frontal. Yeah, the true angular, moment. I think it's right here. Can I ask yeah. something about the language? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I, I'm still not conv convinced about non, the non-fluid. I don't know why, but something not convincing me. And I want to ask you, you think that it's like transcortical affidal or something like that? Transcortical motor or the dynamic, the dynamic variant that you... So, Rafi, little... sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You know, I think the exact uh, definitions of the stroke aphasias do not quite work in the neurodegenerative aphasias. I'm sure Bonlid and, and Jessica will discuss this, so I'm just going to let them discuss it later, but keep in mind that those exact definitions that we use in stroke aphasia don't quite work in the pro progressive aphasias. Um, and, it, and she's also multilingual, so that will, will be in a point of discussion, I think. Yeah, there's a complexity definitely of the clinical presentation is also driven by the way language was structured in her brain, yeah. Okay, so I can take uh, control of these uh, this slides. Salvo, just one quick comment. Go yeah. back to that, the beautiful way you, you drew that. So there's a, a brilliant mm -hmm. paper by um, a Geshwin, not, not the one on the, the call. He's written other brilliant papers, but he wrote it, uh, his brother, Dan, wrote a paper about uh, alien limb. And uh, he describes three types of alien limb. And... The anatomy of this left, uh, you know, uh, premotor, uh, colossal is grasping and groping dominant hand. And that's exactly what we have here. So I, I, I think you should all read that a very important paper by Dan Geshwin. Um, uh, but I think it tells you something about this case. Yeah. First, yeah. Uh, first author of Geshwin, last I think, Jack Cummings. It's from the late 90s. Excellent. Definitely. That it's extremely localizing, very informative. Okay, so uh so you can stop sharing uh, yeah. uh, and I will share my the neuropath from my side. Or I will okay. pay to Dr. Salvatore. All right, thank you. Okay, can you all see the images? Yes, looks beautiful. Okay, so this is the brain and you can see my cursor, I hope, right? Can you see my arrow moving? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. so this is the brain of the patient. This is the left uh, cerebral hemisphere and this is the right cerebral hemisphere. So you definitely you can appreciate how the structure of the gyri around here shows significant degeneration. So these gyri are very thin, very small. So there is evidence of atrophy, mostly affecting you know, the operculum, the operculum area. So the inferior frontal gyrus and even part of the primary motor cortex behind it. There's more sparing of these areas here in the inferior frontal gyrus, more anterior, but then the dorsal lateral aspect are also significantly uh, atrophic. And, you know, on the contralateral hemisphere, which looks much better, there is also a little bit of a hint of opercular atrophy and degeneration, as, uh, as Bruce was mentioning. Okay, there's also atrophy here. You can see the enlargement of the sulci in the temporal lobe. And Salva so Marie Lou just has her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Salvo, can you go back? I just wanted to to point and um. I didn't quite understand each other and where I was pointing before, but that dorsal area, like after the, if you go dorsal, yeah, we're kind of right there. That's the larynx, a little lower. Mm -hmm. a little, yeah, right there. That's the area that Eddie Chen and others have shown in intraoperative mapping. That is really the area of planning and, and um, 
and also controlling the larynx. So many of our patients that have severe motor speech impairment and control of phonation and um, breathing also um, yeah. have a lot of atrophy there. Correct. And yeah. Is that the premotor? Is that the premotor? Can you show the motor versus the pre? Motor. So, yeah, so this area here that you see this gyrus going down here that still looks quite distinct is the primary sensory cortex. And then just right in front of that, there is the primary motor cortex itself, which is now very small. And then even further degenerated is the uh, inferior frontal gyrus right in front of the motor area. So this is the premotor cortex so where we have basically all those associative uh, uh, structures involved with, uh, with phonetics just right in front, basically the uh, representation of the mouth, right? And the tongue in the, in the motor cortex, yeah. Yeah, and the larynx is above that, so. Yeah, so you can see it almost like you can trace like in this area uh, here being more selectively degenerated, even with a little bit of sparing, interestingly, a more anterior portion of the inferior frontal gyrus, while the posterior one is significantly Affected. So this is as selective as, as you can get. Incredible amount of selective uh, uh, vulnerability for specific areas. Yeah. So here we see them in the uh, in the coronal slabs. These are similar to what we saw overall in the uh, MRIs. Um, you know, the brain looked a tiny bit better just because the fixed brain it looked a little bit more uh, not solid, but, you know, we can still tell the significant difference of left versus right, even in the temporal poles look significantly uh, um, different with the left being far more atrophic than the right. So the cerebellum overall looked good, as we said, not much to say here. And uh, um, in terms of the uh, um, brainstem, so the substantia nigra is visible overall. So you see, when we see like a kind of a defined uh, line of dark color, so like uh, black, I mean, this is substantia nigra that is overall okay, not particularly uh, atrophic. And you can see also this locus ceruleus here in the pons, still visible. Okay. So uh, this is the amatoxylin eosin of the inferior frontal gyrus. It shows a significant amount of neuronal loss. You see that the tissue look white in the background as opposed to you know, giving us that pink color of the neuropeel. A lot of neuropeel is, is gone, right? And also many neurons here have disappeared. Most of the cells that you see are actually astrocytes. So you see these very small cells with... Uh, dark nucleus and a little bit of pink uh, uh, components around them. It's their astrocytic cytoplasm. The neurons that are left here are, uh, several of them are enlarged. These are ballooned neurons. So these are neurons undergoing uh, uh, degeneration. So this is by far the was as expected, the most the devastated area of the brain. And then when we stain for phospho tau, uh, the staining of this region, inferior frontal uh, gyrus, showed characteristic peak bodies. So this was a case of peak disease, actually, which is an important cause of the non-fluent variant uh, um, PPA. So peak bodies are this round intracytoplasmic neuronal inclusions. You see there are several of them. Together with that, we see astrocytic inclusions. And these are the typical astrocytes of peak disease that we call ramified astrocytes. So uh, peak disease is a three repeat tauopathy. So when we stain for uh, RD3, which is an antibody that only show three repeat tau, the peak body stains clearly and characteristically. When we stain for four repeat tau, the peak bodies don't show up anymore. So this is a peak body here, large peak body. There is another one right here. As you can see, the peak bodies don't stain for four repeat tau, but the ramified astrocytes do. So this is something always to keep in mind about peak, which is the prototypical uh, three repeat tauopathy. Remember that the astrocytes also contain four repeat in this, uh, in this disease. So this is the hippocampus of this case, stained for RD3. Of course, all the peak bodies in the hippocampus here stained for RD3. So interestingly, you know, peak disease is not a disease that causes a lot of degeneration of the hippocampus, but still has a lot of uh, uh, pathology accumulation in the hippocampus um, itself. If we stain it for four repeat, you see the peak bodies don't stain anymore here. But there are other cells that starts containing four repeat tau 
in the hippocampus. So uh, why is that? Well, I mean, PIC wasn't the only uh, disease in this case. So here is a staining of the middle frontal gyrus for beta amyloid. What we saw was the presence of diffuse plaques. The case did not have neuritic plaques. That means that the degree of Alzheimer's disease copathology was extremely low. So this is diffuse plaques are very early stage. Diffuse plaques were uh, of AD the, the, uh, pathology. Diffuse plaques were seen all the way to the uh, entorhinal cortex. This is what we call a tal phase two. So as you know, there are five phases of beta amyloid uh, spreading in the brain. So tal phase two is still like a very low and early stage of uh, uh, beta amyloid distribution. Um, so um, when staining for RD3, so for three repeat tau, we do see some uh, uh, neuronal uh, inclusions. These are not uh, peak bodies, but these are true neurofibrillary tangles of Alzheimer's disease. So this basically established a BRAC stage of Alzheimer's disease two for this case. So this case had a tau phase two and a BRAC stage two, which are both very low stages of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology, but consistent with the age of the, of the patient. And then in addition to this, there was another for repeat tauopathy, which is ergyrophilic grain disease. This is mostly visible in the CA2 sector of the hippocampus with phosphotau. The most distinctive features are the presence of this ring-like perinuclear inclusions you know, in neurons of the CA2 sector and the presence of grains. The grains are this uh, very round, strong uh, um, uh, deposits, thick deposits, rounded, just like grains, basically, that we see in the, in the neuropeal. So finally, this was a case of peak disease, uh, which is a frontotemporal lobe degeneration with tau inclusion with also argyrophilic grain disease, uh, arterial sclerosis. There was also a very uh, moderate degree of cerebral amyloid angiopathy in a low degree overall of Alzheimer's disease. All of this uh, pathologists from AGD down were incidental. So we don't think that they played any role in the clinical presentation of the case. That was dominated only by uh, peak disease pathology. Okay, I'll stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, going back, you know, if we think about the MRI, um, I should have used the word knife edge because it really was knife edge atrophy in the anterior temporal, the anterior cingulate, and the eye inferior frontal gyra. Yeah, so yeah, knife edge is definitely like it's the most extreme of the of the degeneration. So there are cases in which you know that knife edge is really, really far more severe. Uh, this actually wasn't the most severe, so I can, you know, if, I guess like, you know, going back to the temporal lobe, uh, so the temporal lobe will be okay for TDP type A, probably too much for CBD in, in, in my opinion, um, but definitely there was not so much atrophy as we often see it for peak disease. Um, that uh, you know, that was less competitive in the diagnosis. So I, I think a TDP type A guess could it was uh, appropriate in this case. So peak disease is usually this is the last many years unless you know people present with non fluent variant PPA. Patients with non fluent variant PPA are always the ones that unfortunately have the shorter survival because they very uh, soon uh, get into trouble with swallowing difficulties, you know, in aspiration pneumonia and so on. So the, that strong knife age atrophy, often we see it in cases that have like a 15, 20 years clinical history. Um, this was shorter overall. Okay, so I'll give it back to Luis now and then uh, we can introduce the discussion part of uh, this section. Okay. Thank you so very much, Dr. Espina, for the great neuropathology findings of our patient. And before to start with the uh, presentation of our special panelists, I want to invite you uh, all to participate in our in this uh, Zoom poll number two with these two questions. Do you think being multilingual changes the course of primary progressive aphasia patients? And the second question, will primary progressive aphasia symptoms vary with the languages one predominantly speaks? Please send us your answer, and I will send uh, and I will show the results pretty soon. Let's see. Okay, and we'll give this a few more seconds. I see forty-five percent. Okay. And we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, and. Okay. 
pause since we're at 57%. Okay, and one, we're gonna end this poll and share the results. Luis, how does it look? Well, thank you all for participating in the first question. The majority of our um, public and participants, uh, they think that B multilingual change the course of primary progressive aphasia patients. And in the second question, um, the majority say yes to the primary progressive aphasia symptoms vary the languages of the pre predominantly, uh, one predominantly speaks. So now we will continue with um, our panelist section. So we will have a short panel discussion to hear perspectives from two special guests from the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, incredible panelists specialized in language who will help us to go deep with our clinical case. Please welcome Dr. Jessica De Leon, Assistant Professor of the University of California, San Francisco, and last but not least, Bontin Lee, Dr. Bontin Lee, Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health, and Assistant Professor of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco as well. Welcome, Dr. Jessica. Welcome, Dr. Brun Lee. Thank you so very much for being here with us today. And I will go first with Dr. Jessica De Leon. Dr. De Leon, can you tell us more about how bilingual speakers' brain might differ from monolingual speaker? And I'm also curious if languages are stored in our brain any differently, and what occurs to languages when neurodegeneration occurs? Welcome again, Dr. De Leon. Yeah, I'm really excited about this case. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen with just a couple of slides so we have a little bit of a foundation. Um, okay, does that look okay? Looks great. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, and I think this is great. I think that um, we could use more studies that highlight uh, bilingualism, right? Most of the world, actually, the majority speaks to or more languages, uh, but there haven't been as many studies yet um, about what bilingualism does in PPA. Um, and I'll just lay a bit of a foundation and then we can have a really good discussion, I think. Um, so first to define bilingualism, um, often when we talk about it in the literature, we mean it to also include multilingual speakers. So for example, this case, um, and a lot of what we see are different in bilinguals also applies to what we see in multilinguals as well. So bilingual, multilingual brains uh, probably look for the most part about the same. Um, and as we know from this case, uh, which also is very illustrated, um, there's a lot of factors when we're talking about bilingualism, right? It's not really black or white. Um, so, and Lucy had a really great table just illustrating this, right? That age of acquisition of that second language matters, how people are learning it, whether or not it's in school versus at home, um, you know, proficiency, the number of languages, the types of languages and how different they are. So whether or not it's English and German, for example, or something more dissimilar, like English and Vietnamese probably changes how this is stored as well. Um, and then the patterns of use. So is, is someone switching between their languages on a daily basis? Do they use it a lot or, or you know, not, not so much? So these are probably all factors that contribute um, as well as some other ones like genetics, determinants of health, immigration that also impact how people use their languages. Um, and then there's a few models that have um, tried to provide a bit of a framework for the areas that are important in the bilingual brain. Uh, and as you can see, most of these areas are just important for the language network in general. Um, and then just to, see you, to orient you, you see these circles that have different colors on them. And then each color goes with a model that um, has been proposed for bilingualism. Um, so we expect that there is a lot of overlap between uh, monolingual and bilingual speakers uh, and their brains. Um, but then when it comes to different components of language, so for example, um, semantics, but we expect there to be a lot of overlap in the semantic network, right? and that seems to make sense, right? A horse in, in English or in the, the concept of a horse for a Spanish speaker are probably pretty similar, um, but there's probably less overlap when it comes to morphosyntax and phonology, um, which I think we can talk to, we can talk about in, in our discussion as well for, for this case. Um, and then... When we move beyond those models and look more at imaging studies um, in healthy speakers, we see that there are areas that um, do differ a little bit. So increased gray matter volume in the left um, inferior parietal lobule, um, some of these other areas, um, increased uh, connections among many of these regions. Uh, in general, right, these, are, these are areas that support language control, cognitive control, um, just in general. Um, 
I think something to highlight is that all, the colors don't always overlap in this study. This is a, a review by um, Garcia Penton about areas that are um, increased or enhanced in terms of brain volume. Um, and they don't really overlap. Right? And, and I think that there's a lot of reason behind that. Um, you know, these previous studies haven't really taken to account those factors that I mentioned in the first slide. Um, and so, you know, th they're going to all have effects on, on where we see these brain differences. Um, and then I think another factor to remember, right, is that the brain is really dynamic. So changes are going to be happening in bilingual speakers as they're gaining proficiency in their languages um, and as they're gaining better abilities to switch between their languages. Um, and, you know, these imaging studies really just capture one point in time. Right. So, um, for example, it's thought that as people gain proficiency in their languages, um, it moves from being more of like a frontal type of process, using a lot of frontal resources to using more of those posterior resources. Right? It becomes more automatic. Um, and then there's also, um, um, I guess, postulations that, um, you know, first, it's, it's really this increase in gray matter uh, as someone's learning a language. But as you gain proficiency, the language becomes more consolidated. Those gray matter regions start to return to baseline to look more like a monolingual uh, brain uh, and gray matter, uh, maybe because of pruning, for example. Um, and then it's the white matter tracts that start to increase in volume um, as those connections become more solid. Um, and then in neurodegenerative disease, uh, just I'll just show one slide from a study we did here at UCSF looking at 69 uh, bilingual speakers with PPA. Um, for the most part, we see that the presenting symptoms are still pretty consistent with PPA criteria, um, although there's some unique symptoms as well, and we saw some of these here. Right? So trouble with code switching uh, means uh, trouble with staying in the language that they want to stay in. So speaking Spanish with another Spanish speaker or speaking Vietnamese with a, with a Vietnamese speaker. Um, trouble translating came up a little bit. Um, and then overall, the, the, it seems that the first language to be impacted in someone with PPA who, who happens to be bilingual, um, it tends to be the less dominant language that's impacted first. Um, so the dominance meaning um, the language that, that isn't used as much, um, isn't as proficient at the time of diagnosis. Um, and and this, isn't, this is regardless of whether or not that language is the first language that someone learns, so L1 um, or L2. Um, and, you know, I think maybe that's not something that um, would have been uh, completely obvious to, or, but so, you know, at least now we can see in, in our study that that seems to be the case. Um, you know, this is all retrospective, though, and subjective, so it would be really nice, though, in the future to see what's happening, you know, what's changing as people um, are, are leading up to their diagnosis. Um, and then going back to our case, I think this fits in pretty well what we were hearing, Right, that English, her, her most dominant language at the time of diagnosis, um, seemed to be preserved the longest. Um, and then even though German was, was really her second L1, right, she learned it very early, um, she's not using it as much now. And, and so we see that that's actually something she struggled with. Um, so that's mostly what I wanted to say here. Um, and then on her, on, on neuropsych testing, Overall, it seems that the pattern seems to be about the same as a monolingual speaker with a lot of caveats. Right? So what we have here at UCSF, um, we mostly just have testing in English. Right? So um, these are people who are highly proficient in English and are able to do the testing in English. Um, and it seems like the overall pattern is similar. So you know, if they're SVPPA, that you know, semantics is hit the hardest, for example. Um, but um, you know, even though the, the overall patterns are the same, we do see some differences. So for example, that um, bilingual speakers might have a bit of an advantage, might do better on some of these executive functioning tasks um, because they are exercising a lot of that cognitive control right? when you have to manage the two languages um, and maybe also a little bit uh, easier time um, with phonological tasks, so phonological awareness because they have a larger um, phonological, I guess, uh, repertoire of, of, of sounds in their brain. Um, but they might have a bit harder time with things like picture naming um, or category fluency, um, especially when they're timed and you have to come up, up with it quickly um, because they have to pick which language they want to use. Um, so even though bilingual speakers overall might have a bigger vocabulary, um, they have maybe smaller vocabularies and less experience with each language right, because they have less time that they're using each language. Um, so I, yeah, I think that'll lay a foundation for, for some discussion we can have. I'll stop my share. Um, can I ask one, a beautiful, um, 
Jessica, can I ask one sacrilegious question here? Um, so uh, uh, the, this is someone who balanced so many languages. It must have taken up so, such, so much of maybe her cognitive reserve or built it. But it, it seemed to me that like the areas that you show that are different in, in, in bilingual people are the areas that were hit uh, pretty hard in this particular case. Is there any data that suggests that the, there may be a vulnerability to certain language disorders and, and polylingual people? I have wondered, honestly, but I'd love your, your data. That's more important than my wonderment. Yeah, no, I, I wonder the same exact thing, right? If, if there's like a, or a good balance sort of, of using languages and having it be protective um, and then having it be just like a scattered, I know I, I, a lot of times I just feel like a scattered mess, right? Like trying to, to balance everything. Um, so we did have one paper that came out looking at LVPPAs um, and they seem to have a later age of onset compared to monolingual speakers. Um, so maybe if we're there, right, where you don't have a lot of overlap in phonology, right, and thinking about phonology and LVPPA, that somehow that's protective, um, that you just strengthen those areas. Um, but we, we didn't really see differences in ages of onset for the other two PPA variants. So I, I'm not sure, and I think that that's a great question and, and where we need to be able to look back a little bit, see how, how people are using it. So... Okay, thank you so very much, Dr. De Leon. We will continue now with Dr. Bungli T. Dr. T, building on what Dr. Leon just shared, can you comment how signs of language loss might vary in people who speak multiple languages? I'm also curious if do social and cultural background play a role when there are languages shift amidst neurological changes? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Luis, and thank you for this uh, presenting this uh, very interesting case. Um, let me share my slides. Okay, I know we are running short on time, so uh, we will skip a portion of it. Um, but this is the outline, and um, I was planning to focus on, you know, talking about some of the language symptoms the patient had. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, we are going to focus more on the motor speech impairment and foreign accent. And if we have time in the future, I'd love to talk more about uh, her reading and writing performance. But just to recap, this patient speaks English, German, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Spanish, and Arabic. And English is her probably dominant language in terms of proficiency and age of acquisition and frequency use. So when it comes to motor speech assessment, um, so what we learned from past literature on English speakers, like, you know, for non-fluent patients. So first of all, for non-fluent patients, the motor speech uh, impairment is one of the hallmark features. And most specifically, um, they dis exhibit expressive speech. And then so from past literature on English speakers, we know that there are are ways to elicit a practice of speech. So there's six factors listed here. And then so the first two factors like repeat multiple times and low word frequency is very commonly generalizable across different languages. But what's going to vary is in terms of place and manner of articulations, consonant clusters and multisyllabic words. So we're probably going to focus on that and see how they vary in the languages that this patient speaks. So when it comes to place of articulation, so um, we can look at the different regions they the point of articulation of each language is like um, so we have the different colors over uh, here and then so you can see that um, most languages that she speaks actually has a wide range of variation in terms of place of articulation but take a look at Spanish which is uh, in red and then later on Mandarin which is in purple they are more constricted or limited over the more uh, frontal region so if we look at the numbers of points of articulation in the different languages, there are some of the languages she speaks in German and Arabic, they have like wide range of place that they can uh, move around. And so the more high travel the words are, it's usually more easier for us to uh, elicit a practice of speech. But then there are Spanish and Mandarin where it's more limited and then you're more confined into a more frontal region of the orofaryngeal um, space. So when uh, one thing we also learned when we studied our Chinese PPA cases is that when we ask them to repeat multiple times phrases that only vary 
this in place of articulation. You see that all PPA performs slightly lower than controls, but non fluent PPA doesn't perform significantly lower than the other PPA variants. So maybe suggesting that because there's limited changes in the place of articulation embedded in the linguistic features itself, certain languages doesn't um, wait so much on place of articulation to elicit place uh, a proxy of speech. So similarly, when we look at manner of articulations, although there are certain manners that we often overlap between the different languages, like for instance, nasal, plosive, fricative or fricatives, there are certain ways of you know, manner of articulations that's very specific for certain languages. And how does that play a role in our language symptoms, right? So uh, we can see, we can take a look at English and Mandarin. So when we look at English, when you look at their uh, proxy of speech, criteria for English speakers, one of the things that we know is that they often have voicing errors. So they have a lot of manner of articulation that transition between voice and voiceless words. So, but when they have a practice of speech, they tend to have voicing errors, like they will say car uh, instead of, uh, so they will say gar instead of car, they will say pig instead of pig. But this is not possible because uh, Chinese doesn't have much voice sounds. But Chinese has a lot of aspiration sounds. So what we actually notice both in children and in our PPA cases is that they have more de-aspiration errors. So they would say for a bang instead of pang. So they would de-aspirate the sound. So that's manner of articulation. So when it comes to phonology, word length, it also varies between the different languages that she speaks, right? So shown here in this table is the uh, orthography and phonological word length of different Indo-European languages. And then on the right, you can see that's like, you know, um, the Vietnamese uh, longest word and then the Arabic longest word. So I'm trying to show here is that that's like Mandarin and Vietnamese. The words are generally one or two syllables. But then there's German and Spanish where the words can go up to 30 plus letters, almost nearing 40. So you have um, a different capacity to develop multisyllabic words in different languages. So for Mandarin and Venomous, one thing that we know is that we can't really use multisyllabic words. We have to use multiple characters to elicit AOS. And then last is actually consonant clusters. So consonant clusters is um, also varies quite a bit between the different languages. So there are like languages like English and German where the consonant cluster is abundance. Like that's, if you look at the consonant inventory, English has 26, German has 45. If you count the final cons cons consonant clusters at the final word, uh, final location, that you can go up to 160. But Vietnamese, Mandarin and Arabic has only like zero to three or four. Um, so we can use consonant cluster to elicit, but what we use is that we use lexical tone. So. For those that's not um, familiar, but Chinese is a tonal language. And we always say that the best way to understand this is using like um, tone twisters or one syllable tongue twisters. So like this sentence here is pronounced as shi 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 So it means a poet named Shi lives in a stone house, ate a lion and swear to eat 10 lions. So essentially different, uh, same syllables with different tones, it has different meanings. And so when we tested our non-fluent cases, they have a lot of tonal errors uh, when they even produce like just uh, one tongue twisters, uh, tone twisters. So if I were to play this. 十, 十, 四, 十, 十, 四, 四, 十, 十, 四, 四, 四. So if we do a group level, so you can see that all the inaccurate tones I highlighted them in red. So in short, if we do a group analysis, we'll find that non-fluent PPA actually, if you just ask them to repeat just two tone twisters sentence, you can already see that they differentiate quite remarkably from the other PPA variants. And they correlate really well with the left anterior insular region, which we know is very related to motor programming um, of speech. And so shown here is that if we ask them to repeat uh, phrases that differ in place of articulation, manner of articulation, tone of articulation. We can see a place of articulation is not that help, helpful in differentiating non-fluent PPA, but manner and tone of articulation is really significant. Um, and then if we look at the errors, we can see that non-fluent PPA tends to produce higher proportion of tonology errors compared to phonology errors. So they have more tone errors. And if we ever do like a tone um, prevalence, um, the tone error prevalence of, um, and then we do a BBM analysis, we'll find that tone, the more tone errors is actually correlated with the left premortal regions, which is quite aligned with um, a motor speech uh, network. So I just wanted to just talk uh, two more slides about foreign accent syndrome. So um, 
I, this case actually had this um, presentation where her student noticed that she has uh, her Mandarin accented English and then she, her, her Vietnamese tone sounds like Mandarin. So there's one also one case like, you know, that reported PPA having foreign accent syndrome. Um, so it was like a, a non-fluent PPA case as well in 64. Um, so she was said to have a Spanish accent in Italian language. Um, and this was how they describe it. They have like altered vowel and consonants and linking one word to the next. And I'm not an Italian, not Spanish speaker. So, but I'm, uh, but um, they were able to ask people to judge and all of the bystander um, all of the non like not familiar with the case people just said it was Spanish accent but what I really want to look into is like how does one can uh, you know like how does it overlap between a proxy of speech and English that has Mandarin accent so one thing I think uh, when we look at how we describe one person having man, uh, Mandarin accent when they speak English is that one thing is often commonly said is that they have equal lexical stress so English is a stress language so we have present and present they are different or we would say banana or butterfly so we will stress one of the syllables but Chinese doesn't have stress because it's monosyllabic so we tend to stress or we tend to pronounce each syllable equally or that we don't have enough consonant clusters so when it comes to producing consonant clusters sometimes we might add an additional vowel in it so we instead of saying secret we'll say secret or strawberry will be strawberry um, and then there are certain vowels uh, and consonant that doesn't appear in Chinese so like v or sh or th so we tend to substitute um, V with W, like every with hourly, or birthday with birthday. Not me, but, yeah, but I think some people. Um, and then uh, there's also lack of final consonant because we don't have that many final consonants. So um, sometimes they will say car, yeah. uh, for car, they will say car, or they will say thin for think. And then it's like for English, there's a lot of sentence level um, um, stress as well like I don't think she will listen to him it's different from I don't think she will listen to him so I think this is also lack more lacking when um, a Mandarin native speaker speaks English so you can see a lot of these symptoms are common in a proxy of speech as well which is why it can be also manifesting as a foreign accent syndrome and when it comes to Vietnamese tones, um, so like Vietnamese has six tones and they are actually more complicated in the structure. If I can play this. Ma, 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 ha. And this is Mandarin tones. Ma, 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 ma. So Mandarin has a more simple structured tone and you don't have the break in between. Like Vietnamese is very famous for the break in between tones. Um, so it is possible that West she develop motor speech impairment, she tends to simplify her tonal structures and may somehow sound like a Mandarin tones instead. Um, so I'm going to skip the rest uh, in the interest of time and um, so that we have time for discussion. But I also want to say it's more than the one that we presented, there's many literature suggesting that PPA symptoms varies in different languages. Um, and then we probably have to look into this um, to the generalizability of what we learn about PPA so that we can ensure we have equitable healthcare worldwide. So, um, Okay, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Boom Lee. Unfortunately, we, don't, we have some limited time. I encourage everyone to reach out and continue the conversation after the session. And I will conclude with uh, this comment, being multilingual or bilingual is part of our world today. Mastering a new language is an advantage we connect with us with others. However, in the learning process, we don't know have the same perfect accent speaking in different languages. And this is completely normal. Unfortunately, there is more cases of psychological damages of linguistic racism or racism based in accent, ac accent across the globe. To conclude this session, we want to invite you to embrace our uniqueness and taking pride in speaking with our regional accent. May the Babel of Tower and all these amazing, different and beautiful languages join us and not divide us. The most important language is the kindness. Thank you so very much. Um, <clears throat> Go back with you, Camelia.
Yes, thank you, Luis, and everybody. Thank you so very much for joining today. Clearly, this discussion could go on for hours. We've shared a link in the chat for you to complete a very short survey. Thank you to Kaylee Mateo, who prepared the survey. We appreciate your feedback. And if you're still here, please just give an online round of applause for Luis and Salvo and Jessica and Boom Lead, um, who worked so hard in preparing this case and their comments. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining today and sharing your ideas. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care, everybody.